Today, we're going to hear from another Jethro, uh, a much smarter and wiser Jethro, uh, but yet still he has a fresh and different perspective on things, a godly perspective. And so who is this other Jethro? In Genesis chap- or Exodus chapter 18, verse 1, we're told, Now Jethro, the priest of Midian, Moses' father-in-law, heard of all that God had done for Moses and for Israel, his people, and how the Lord had brought Israel out of Egypt. So Jethro is the father of Zipporah, the wife of Moses. Uh, he's the priest of Midian. Uh, and this is a people group that Moses had fled to when he was no longer welcome in Egypt. So let's just jump back for a moment with a quick history review. You remember the book of Genesis is about four major events and four major people. Number one, the number one event is the creation of all physical matter by God, atomic structure, which he formed everything out of, the whole universe and everything it contains, including us, people, mankind. Uh, The second major event is the fall of man to sin, when man chose himself and his own way over God the Creator and God's way. This third major event is the judgment of sinful man by God with a worldwide flood. And God provided a way of salvation, you remember, in the ark that Noah built. Yet only eight people in the entire world accepted God's provision for their salvation. The fourth major event is the separation of people into nations at the Tower of Babel. Uh, As the descendants of Noah multiplied, uh, they refused to follow God's command and spread out and populate the earth. Instead, they conspired together to build a tower to heaven. They conspired together to provide their own way to heaven. They thought they could get to heaven by the work of their two hands. And so God strongly encouraged them uh, to spread out by introducing all the different languages in the world as we know today. And he implanted these languages into the people, into their minds. And uh, so there was mass confusion. However, the people connected with the other people that could communicate with them with those same languages. And that caused them to uh, go off together and separate Uh, into different parts of the earth. The first major uh, person, those are the four major events, the first major person we see in the book of Genesis is Abraham. Abraham was separated with these people that spoke Hebrew, and he ended up in the land of Ur. And God asked Abraham to leave that land and to follow God to a land that God had for him, specifically for him. And he promised Abraham that he would be the father of many nations. The second major person was Abraham and Sarah's son Isaac. You remember Abraham's firstborn was Ishmael, whose mother was Sarah's maid Hagar. Uh, Remember uh, Abraham and Sarah uh, decided together to choose Hagar as a surrogate mother uh, in an attempt to help God keep his promise. And they quickly found out God does not need help in keeping his promises. And Ishmael becomes the father of all the Arab nations. Uh, They're all descended from Ishmael. Uh, God fulfilled his promise to Abraham and Sarah. She she gave birth to her oldest son, or to her only son in her old age, Isaac, the promised son. Well, what about the nation of Midian and Jethro here? Where, Where does Jethro hail from? Well, after Sarah died, Abraham remarried. And we're told in Genesis chapter 25, verse 1, Now Abraham took another wife, who's, after Sarah had passed on, whose name was Keturah. She bore to him Zimram and Joshan and Median, or Medan and Midian and Ishbuk and Shua, or Ishbak. So Jethro, the priest of Midian, is a descendant of Abraham through his second wife, Keturah. The third major person in Genesis is the son of Isaac, who was named Jacob, and his name was changed to Israel, remember? Uh, Jacob then had 12 sons, or Israel had 12 sons, who became the 12 12 fathers of the nation of Israel. And they all have a tribe or, or clan named after them. The 11th son of Israel is Joseph, Not the husband of Mary, the stepfather of Jesus, this is much earlier, but Joseph uh, with the technicolor dream coat, or as God puts it, the coat of many colors, right? 
So these 12 sons and their families, they end up living in Egypt because of a famine in the land. And they multiplied there. And they eventually, they are perceived as a threat by the Pharaoh. And so he enslaves them. They were enslaved for 400 years. And God raises up Moses, a descendant of Levi. Levi is a brother of Joseph, one of the 12 sons of Jacob or Israel. God raises up Moses to lead the Hebrew people out of slavery from Egypt. And at age 40, Moses attempts to do this by his own efforts. And uh, in, in standing up for a Hebrew and killing an Egyptian. However, no one followed him. And uh, he was a wanted man by Egypt for killing the Egyptian. And so he fled from Egypt across the desert to Midian, where he meets Jethro and his daughter Zipporah, whom Moses marries and has two sons with. So 40 years go by, and God speaks to Moses in the form of a burning bush, and he tells Moses to return to Egypt in order to lead God's people out of slavery, bring them back to this land that God had promised to them, had promised to Abraham. Uh, after arguing with God and, and uh, bringing God really to the, to the point that it says his anger burned against Moses, Moses finally agrees to go along with God's plan. And in Exodus chapter 4, verse 18, we're told, Then Moses departed, and he returned to Jethro, his father-in-law. This is after he had heard from God. He returns to Jethro, his father-in-law, and he says to him, Please let me go, that I may return to my brethren who are in Egypt, and see if they are still alive. And Jethro said to Moses, Go in peace. So even though Moses is on a mission from God, he still stops and he asks Jethro for his permission. Jethro is the patriarch or the elder or the leader of the family, uh, as well as the, the father of Moses' wife and the grandfather of Moses' children, whom he would be moving out of country. And I, and I believe when God calls us to serve him uh, in a way that affects others in our family, uh, I believe God will work it out in their hearts so that even though we are following God, we, we can still ask for permission and we can leave with their blessing or follow God with their blessing, uh, as Moses and his family did here. Uh, now, that may not always be the case. There may be times that the family refuses to respond or acknowledge God's calling in our lives. Uh, and, and we're called to choose God over family sometimes. Uh, Jesus says in, uh, in Luke 18, verse 28, actually Peter said, Behold, we have left our homes and followed you. He said this to Jesus. And Jesus said to them, Truly I say to you, there is no one who has left house or wife or brothers or parents or children for the sake of the kingdom of God who will not receive many times much more at this time and in the age to come, eternal life. So Moses, he gets a blessing. It's a good thing from, from Jethro, his father-in-law. And uh, as he departs Midian, Jethro says, Go in peace. Then in Exodus 4.19, now the Lord said to Moses in Midian, Go back to Egypt, for all the men who were seeking your life are dead. And so Moses took his wife and his sons and mounted them on a donkey and returned to the land of Egypt. Moses also took the staff of God in his hand. So God informs Moses that the one it did poster is no longer hanging in the Egyptian post office. You know, it's safe for him to get back to Egypt. He's not a wanted man anymore. And so Moses leaves, and something very interesting happens, happens on the way concerning Moses' wife. In Exodus 4, verse 24, it says, Now it came about at the lodging place on the way. So they're on the way to Egypt. They stop, you know, camp out. Uh, it says, The Lord met him, Moses, and sought to put him to death. Verse 25, Then Zipporah took a flint and cut off her son's foreskin and threw it at, the, at Moses' feet, and she said, You are indeed a bridegroom of blood to me. So he let him alone. God let Moses alone. He didn't kill him. At that time, she said, You are a bridegroom of blood because of the circumcision. So this gives us a little insight to maybe what has been lost over the years there in Midian. Remember Midian, he was the son of Abraham through Keturah. And, and God made a covenant with Abraham, and the sign of that covenant was circumcision. And all the males in Abraham's household, including the servants, were circumcised. And so Abraham most likely passed on this experience 
with the true and living God to his other sons like Midian. But apparently over 400 years later, Zipporah wants nothing to do with this covenant and only obeys God really in order to save the life of Moses, her husband. And then we do not hear about Zipporah again until here in chapter 18, which we're about to get to. So apparently after this awkward camping experience, Zipporah and her sons went back to Midian. uh, Moses sent them away and Moses went on to Egypt without her. And that brings us to Exodus chapter 18, verse 1. Now Jethro, the priest of Midian, Moses' father-in-law, heard of all that God had done for Moses and for Israel, his people, and how the Lord, notice this is Lord in all caps, that means Y-H-W-H, it's Yahweh or Jehovah. This is the name of God, not the title Lord, but the actual name of God the Father. How the Lord had brought Israel out of Egypt. Verse 2, Jethro, Moses' father-in-law, took Moses, Moses' wife Zipporah, after he had sent her away, and her two sons, of whom was na- one was named Gershom. For Moses said, I have been a sojourner in a foreign land, because Moses was a foreigner in the land of Midian. Uh, and then verse 4, the other was named Eleazar, for he said, the God of my father was my help and delivered me from the sword of Pharaoh. And you remember, uh, God got Moses safely to the land of Midian, when he was fleeing uh, for his life. Verse 5, Then Jethro, Moses' father-in-law, came with his sons and his wife to Moses in the wilderness where he camped at the Mount of God. Notice that Jethro heard the buzz about what God was doing in and through the life of Moses and the people of Israel. Consider the methods of communication at this time, you know, compared to the methods of transmitting news today. I mean, the only way news was transmitted back then was verbally, person to person, or maybe with a hand-delivered parchment on a scroll. Uh, And it's only been a number of months since they've left Israel. And the other countries, they've already heard about what God is doing, about God working in the life of the Hebrews and what He did to Egypt. You know, when the Lord works today, How much faster does that news spread? Everything good and and things bad uh, are so much more public knowledge than they've ever been before. So much faster. So because Moses was obedient to the call of God, the Hebrew people, they experienced God in a very real way, right? When Moses went back to Egypt and they got to see God perform these plagues and lead them out. The Egyptian people, they experienced God in a very powerful and real way. So much so that we're told a mixed multitude left Egypt with the Hebrews. And now we see that these other countries, like Midian, are experiencing the true and living God secondhand. Do do you see how God makes himself known to the world? It's through people, us, you and me. You are the ones that God has chosen to make himself known to your workplace, to your school, to your club or sporting activities, to your neighborhood. What is God calling you to do? Like Moses, are are you arguing with God about what he is capable of? of doing in and through you. And like with Moses, is God burning with anger because of it, because of our hesitation? Exodus 18.6 says, He sent word to Moses, Jethro did, I, your father-in-law, Jethro, am coming to you with your wife and her two sons with her. Then Moses went out to meet his father-in-law, and he bowed down and kissed him. And they asked each other of their welfare, and they went into the tent. Imagine as Jethro entered this camp of approximately two million people. I mean, this is a lot of people. This is a big camp. And he's walking past all of these people that God is leading through Moses, his son-in-law. And Moses, who who has held up his staff and the Red Sea was parted, 
Moses who struck the rock to provide water. Moses who held his arms up, remember, and Israel won their first battle. You would think Moses is kind of a big deal. But Moses didn't think so. Moses bowed down to Jethro, showing that Moses still considered Jethro the patriarch of the family. Moses was a very humble man, meaning he knew that it was God who was working in and through him. Humility is crucial for ministry. Humility is vital for God to work in and through us. In 1 Peter 5.5, 5, Peter writes, You younger men, likewise, be subject to your elders, and all of you clothe yourselves with humility toward one another. For God is opposed to the proud, but gives grace to the humble. If we take credit for what God is doing in and through us, becoming proud of ourselves because we think we're just so awesome, God says he will be in opposition to us. Well, how well is our ministry going to go? How well is our life going to go when God is in opposition to us? If God is opposed to us, it's not going to go well, let me tell you. However, when we are willing to admit the truth, that it is, in fact, God who is working in and through us and deserves the credit for anything positive that comes out of us, like Moses, when we are honest with ourselves and with those around us in humility, God gives us grace, we're told here. Now, don't misunderstand. Peter is not telling us that God will act gracious towards us, which God does. But what Peter is telling us here, what James also tells us, in chapter 4 of his letter, the same exact thing, that God gives grace to the humble. God gives us this power of his grace, this resource of his grace. You might be wondering, well, what can I do with this resource? You know, will it heat my house in the wintertime? Will it fuel my car? Will it fill my stomach? What exactly is this power and resource capable of doing? Well, that's a very good question. I'm glad you guys asked. In Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8, we're told, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not as a result of works, so that no one may boast, so that no one may become proud. God gives grace to the humble, and it is by God's grace that we obtain salvation. It is by God's grace that we are saved from receiving what we have earned through our sin, which is eternal separation from God, uh, an eternal membership to a place void of God, a place of weeping and gnashing of teeth, as the Bible describes it. In Romans chapter 3, verse 24, we're told, being justified as a gift by His grace through the redemption which is in Christ Jesus. God gives grace to the humble, and we are justified by God's grace. So not only are we saved from what we have earned by our own sin, but also through God's grace, God now considers us just as we had never sinned in the first place. In our society today, if you are convicted of a felony, and you uh, serve your sentence, and you are released from prison, you did the crime, you did the time, and now you're out, you still have the stigma of being an ex-con, and you no longer have many of the rights you once had as an American citizen. The right to bear arms, the, the right to vote. You will always be tainted by that crime. You will always be an ex-felon. But not so with God. Because of His grace, it is not so. We did the crime but Jesus did the time for us. And now through this power of God's grace, we are justified in the eyes of God. It's just as though we had, we had lived this perfect life in the eyes of God. And we are considered citizens of the kingdom of God with all the rights and privileges that go along with that. And this is all by the power of God's grace, which he gives to the humble. 
If you were under the impression that you are so awesome that you deserve God's grace, that you are entitled to God's grace in any way, shape, or form, plan on waiting a while down at the mailbox. It's going to be a long time because God says He is in opposition to that prideful attitude. Acts 20, verse 32 says, And now I commend you to God and to the word of His grace, to the word of His grace, which is able to build you up, you and build you up, and to give you the inheritance among all those who are sanctified. God's grace is able to build us up, not build us up in pride, but build us up in the truth of God and what He has done for us and continues to do through us and in us. 2 Corinthians 4.15 says, For all things are for your sakes, so that the grace which is spreading to more and more people may cause the giving of thanks to abound to the glory of God. God's grace causes the giving of thanks to abound. Does pride give thanks? No. Pride demands thanks. If you're ever in the position where you're demanding thanks, That's a prideful position. Humility gives thanks. God gives grace to the humble. Grace causes thanks to abound. Titus 2.11, For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all men, instructing us to deny ungodliness and worldly desires and to live sensibly, righteously, and godly in the present age looking for the blessed hope and the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, our Christ Jesus, who gave himself for us to redeem us from every lawless deed and to purify for himself a people for his own possession, zealous for good works. God's grace teaches us to deny ungodliness and worldly lusts. God's grace teaches us to live sensibly and righteously and godly in this present day and age. Does that answer your question? What can we do with this resource of God's grace? By it, we're granted salvation. We are considered justified in God's eyes. By it, it builds us up in the truth of God. It caused the giving of thanks to abound. It teaches us to deny ungodly and worldly lusts, living sensibly and righteously and godly this very day and age. This grace is some pretty awesome stuff, isn't it? And how do we get it? God gives it to us when we are humble, when we admit the truth that it is Him that is providing the power. Have you ever seen a truck that it has it posted on the side, powered by natural gas? Or maybe a little electric car that says, powered by electricity. Or just the other day, I was on the way to work. I was behind this little Volkswagen diesel. And on the back window, it had the statement posted, powered by vegetable oil, French fry oil. Our lives, our attitudes, our actions... They need to be posted with the statement, powered by God's grace. Do you understand? That's what humility is. It's giving the credit where the credit is due. Yes, we play a part. Just like that, the trucks, the little cars, the Volkswagen diesels, they're all great things. But without any fuel, without any power, they're absolutely useless. They're only good for growing weeds around out in the backyard, right? Likewise, we have all been given uh, talents and abilities by God, but without the right power source, we're absolutely useless. We're just there, like a rusty old car in the back field. Not only is the humility of Moses seen in his actions of bowing to his father-in-law, but it can be seen in what he says. Look here in verse 8 of Exodus chapter 18. Moses told his father-in-law all that the Lord had done to Pharaoh and to the Egyptians for Israel's sake, all the hardship that had befallen them on the journey, and how the Lord had delivered them. Moses tells Jethro all that the Lord has done. Not all that Moses had done, but all that the Lord had done. 
He also told him of the difficulties they came across on their journey and how it was the Lord that had delivered them, not Moses and his staff. Now, if we're thinking, okay, well, that, hey, that's a great point. You know, I'll have to try and remember to give God the credit next time I tell somebody about my life. If you have to try and tell some, if you have to try and remember to give God the credit, then you really don't believe God deserves that credit. Up here, you and I, we're proud of that event. We're proud of that, this or that, whatever it is. And in order to appear humble, I'll have to remember to give God the credit. It says God gives grace to the humble, not, get, not God gives grace to those that act like they're humble. God's no fool. People can be fooled, I can be fooled, but there's no fooling God. He knows our hearts. Moses was not ma manipulating the situation. He just told what he believed to be the truth. And the truth was, God did all these things. Moses was just the glove on the hand of God. God gives grace to the humble, but he is opposed to the proud. True humility is crucial for ministry because God's grace is needed. Without humility, there's no grace. There's no power. There's no resource. And what was the result of Moses humbly admitting the truth about God? Verse 9 says, Jethro rejoiced over all the goodness which the Lord, which Yahweh, had done to Israel in delivering them from the hand of the Egyptians. What was the result of Moses humbly admitting the truth about God? Jethro rejoiced over all the goodness which the Lord Yahweh had done to Israel. The people of Israel had the privilege of seeing God working with their own two eyes. The people of Egypt had the privilege of seeing God working with their own eyes. Jethro, remember, he first heard the buzz about what God had done, but now he gets to hear an eyewitness account from Moses, given in true humility. And Jethro rejoiced over all the goodness which the Lord had done. He rejoiced, he celebrated, he cheered, exalted, he delighted in the Lord. What do you suppose Jethro's response would have been if Moses recounted the story a little differently? What if Moses would have said, you know, hey, Jethro, you should have been there. We were all camped out, you know, by the, by the sea, and the Egyptian army, they actually came after us. So I prayed, I prayed, you know, and, and I fasted, and I took a step of faith, and I stood next to the sea, and I held my staff in the air, and I really believed, and the sea parted, and we went across. And we, that time we had too much water, but you know, the next time we didn't have any water. But I heard the people complaining, and I took my staff, and I had faith, and I beat water out of that rock when I struck it, and I believed it in my heart, and the water flowed. How do you suppose Jethro would have responded to Moses' account if it was full of a bunch of I did instead of God did? You know, maybe he'd be throwing a party for Moses. But what good is that? I mean, that's kind of like winning a game that you cheated at. How could there be any satisfaction in knowing that the only way you could possibly appear to win is by cheating? Us taking credit for what God is doing, it's the same thing. You know, oh, I get the credit because I asked God to do it. I get the credit because I believed that God would do it. I get the credit because I allowed God to work through me which according to Paul, which we covered recently, Paul says, really that just seems to be our reasonable service considering what God has done for us, isn't it? Now I'm not saying we need to watch what we say or be more careful how we word things. It's not about that. It goes much deeper. It's in our hearts. What do we really believe? 
Do we really believe that it is God who is working in and through us? Or do we believe that God has given us a few pointers in this book so that we can do some good things with this life of mine that he has given me? What do we really believe? Are we the latex glove on the hand of the brain surgeon? Or do we think we are the brain surgeon that's picked up a few tips and tricks from this textbook? The world will tell you you're the brain surgeon. The Bible tells us we're more like the latex glove on the surgeon's hand. And if we remain pliable, flexible, unhindering, the surgeon can do some amazing things while wearing us. If we do not remain pliable, you know, he's got a whole box of gloves right there at his disposal. And when that box is empty, there's a whole shelf of boxes in the storage closet. You see, Moses has not forgotten how far out of his league God has called him to. Moses has not forgotten how he argued with God, trying to convince God that God had the wrong man because Moses knew he was not capable of doing what God wanted him to do. So when God did these amazing things through Moses, Moses knew it wasn't Moses. And so it came out in his attitude. It came out in his actions and even in his accolades. And so Jethro, the outcome, Jethro rejoiced in the Lord. Not rejoiced in Moses. He rejoiced in the Lord. And, verse 10, so Jethro said, Blessed be the Lord who delivered you from the hand of the Egyptians and from the hand of Pharaoh, and who delivered the people from under the hand of the Egyptians. First Jethro rejoiced in the Lord, and then he calls for blessing upon the Lord. And again, because Moses testified truthfully, giving the credit to God, Jethro has been given this opportunity to see a more accurate picture of who God is and what God does. And from this accurate picture, Jethro concludes not only to rejoice in the Lord, not only to call upon, call blessing upon the Lord, but check this out in verse 11. Jethro says, Now I know that the Lord, this is Lord in all caps, Yahweh, now I know, now, now I know that Yahweh is greater than all the gods. Indeed, it was proven when they dealt proudly against the people Then Jethro, Moses' father-in-law, took took burnt offerings and sacrifices for God, and Aaron came with all the elders of Israel to eat a meal with Moses' father-in-law before God. You know, there are different thoughts on where Jethro was spiritually before this. Some conclude that because the Midianites were descendants of Abraham, that Jethro was a man of God. Others believe that the Midianites worshipped many gods, like many of the other cultures, these pagan cultures. From just a simple reading of this passage here, it sounds as if Jethro previously had consideration for many gods, many different gods. But after hearing the truthful testimony about Yahweh, the true and living God, now Jethro concludes that he now knows that Yahweh is the real God. And to put his money where his mouth is, he made, a, he made burnt offerings and sacrifices for God. Next time, in the rest of this chapter, we'll see that Jethro has some very wise and godly advice for Moses. But I suppose the point that the Lord has for us today is, if we can remain humble, meaning... If we know that we are the glove on the surgeon's hand, the surgeon can do amazing things with us on his hands. But as soon as the glove starts directing the hand, as soon as the glove becomes a hindrance to the hand of God and begins taking credit for the incredible surgery that was performed while God was wearing that particular glove, Again, the glove becomes a hindrance to the hand of God. You see, God does not just work with actions. You know, there are relatively 
few eyewitnesses to these different actions of God. There are very many, but relatively speaking, there are few compared to the multitudes of people that hear the testimony of the actions of God over the centuries. There are far more hearing the testimony than there are actual eyewitnesses. With that in mind, do you see how crucial humility is in ministry? With that in mind, can you see why God gives grace to the humble? And He's opposed to the proud. It's about the truth of the testimony. It's about God being glorified in the testimony. In how we present God. Not us being glorified. You are the one that God has chosen. To make Himself known to your workplace, your school, your club or sporting activity, your neighborhood, your circle of influence. You are the one that God has chosen. Do you know in your heart that you are just the glove on the hand of God? And if you do, do you realize what an incredible privilege that is to be used by the hand of God? Have you ever put on just a perfect fitting pair of gloves? Gloves that you can freely move your hands with, gloves that you can Wear while you work. Man, I think that's what God desires for each one of us to be that kind of glove, a glove that he can work with while wearing. Let's pray, and then Bob's going to come forward and lead us in communion. Lord, we just thank you for being our God. We thank you for giving us your grace, Lord. And Lord, I just ask that you would help us to see the truth in our hearts, Lord. Not to pretend to be humble, but to see who we are, like Moses. And to see who you are and what you've done for us, Lord. And how incredible are the things that you want to do with us, in us, and through us if we would just be that pliable glove, Lord, if we would just let you work, let you have your way, let you move freely, Lord, if we would just let go of our flesh. And so, Lord, I just ask, we need help, Lord, to do that. It sounds so simple, but it's so difficult for us, Lord, and you know that. And we ask for your help. I ask for your help for each and every one here, each and every person that is watching each and every believer in this world, Lord, I just ask that you would help us to see us clearly and, Lord, to see you clearly and see how you want to work in our lives and how you want to use your testimony to reach the world for you so that all would be able to experience your grace. You tell us that your will is that none would perish, that all would come to repentance. Lord, help us to be available for you to accomplish your will. Lord, be with us this week. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Just a uh, few chapters before... Uh what we had the teaching on today in Exodus chapter 12, starting in verse 17 through 20. It says, So you shall observe the feast of unleavened bread, for on this same day I will have brought your armies out of the land of Egypt. Therefore you shall observe this day throughout your generations as an everlasting ordinance. In the first month, on the 14th day of the month at evening, you shall eat unleavened bread until the 21st day of the month at evening. For seven days no leaven shall be found in your houses, since whoever eats what is leavened, that person shall be cut off from the congregation of Israel, whether he is a stranger or a native of the land. You shall eat nothing leavened, 
and all your dwellings you shall eat unleavened bread. In just a moment, we're going to participate in communion. And going back into the Old Testament, it kind of gives us the reasoning behind it. And if you recall, the Passover where the death angel came and wiped out the firstborn throughout the entire nation except those that had the blood painted around their doorposts. Um, Christ was our Passover lamb as it's talked about in the New Testament. We don't have to worry about whether it's leavened or unleavened bread that we take within our physical body. But in the scriptures, when it's talking about leaven or the yeast in the bread, it's specifically talking about referencing sin or things that are in our, in our life that we need to get rid of. And if you think about this Passover, it was right before the Israelites marched out of Egypt. And if you think about it this way, by participating in this Feast of Unleavened Bread, it was right after they were released from their bondage of 400 years of slavery. And I know that I've faced my share of bondage, my, my share of uh, vices, my share of stuff in my life that I didn't need. And when I come to this table, if, if I'm not in a place where those things are, are gone from my life, it's hard for me to do this. It, because when I do that, it tells us in the Bible that we're eating and drinking judgment. And that's not what I want to be a part of. In 1 Corinthians, and this is the message translation, 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 6, and 6 through 8, it says, Your flip and callous arrogance in these things bothers me. You pass it off as a small thing, but it's anything but that. Yeast, too, is a small thing, but it works its way through a whole batch of bread dough pretty fast. So get rid of this yeast. Our true identity is flat and plain, not puffed up with the wrong kind of ingredient. The Messiah, our Passover lamb, has already been sacrificed for the Passover meal, and we are the unraised bread part of the feast. So let's live out our part in the feast, not as raised bread swollen with the yeast of evil, but as flat bread, simple, genuine, unpretentious. The last time we partook in communion, about a month ago, Rob had us fill out a little sheet of paper for those that wanted to bring it up and put it in the little holes that are drilled in the cross of areas that we're struggling with, areas that might have control over our life, things that are keeping us being of full service to the Lord. Those were uh, pulled together by Rob, uh, and they were sent out to myself and Lynn, and we've been praying over those. Matter of fact, I sent a note last night or the night before asking, guys, let's go over this one more time. Let's pray over these, these issues that people have within the congregation. I would challenge you, if you are still struggling with some of those things that you wrote down, I'm going to have Lynn and Rob come down, and, and if you're still struggling with those, please, 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 this place that we call a house of worship, even though it's a gym, it doesn't matter. This is God's house, and these are God's people. And we all want to see each other succeed in the Lord, to be broken of that bondage that is hampering your service to the Lord, that might be hampering your relationship with your family. This is the safest place you're going to find, period. Let me read to you out of the book of James, chapter 5. It says, is anyone among you suffering? Let him pray. Is anyone cheerful? Let him sing psalms. Is anyone among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith will save the sick, and the Lord will raise him up. And if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. Confess your trespasses to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. We're going to participate in this, in this communion time. 
We're going to take the grape juice, which is representative of Christ's blood, dying on the cross for us, being raised again three days later. We're going to participate in the unleavened bread, which represents his body, which he sacrificed for us. If you've got some things going on in your life that think, man, I can't, I can't get over this on my own. I don't have the power within me to overcome this. Please come down. We're going to have the musicians come. They're going to pl uh, play for us. But um, as we take communion, if you are a believer in Christ, that's all we ask to participate in this communion. It's not uh, any religious affiliation. It's just a believer in Jesus Christ, that he died for your sins, and you've accepted him as your Savior. And as you do, just come down the middle aisle and go back out around. But if you, if you need prayer this morning, please don't leave here today without it. And if you've never accepted Christ as your Savior, today would be a good day. He has been waiting for you to come home. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, as we come right now uh, to celebrate your death, burial, and resurrection, through the taking of the juice, the taking of the unleavened bread, Father, we just thank you for your sacrifice with your son Jesus that we have an opportunity to celebrate eternal life with you forever. Lord, as we participate in this, I pray that we would come to you and ask for forgiveness of those areas in our life that we know are unacceptable to you. That we could come here, Lord, with, a, with pure motives, that we could participate in this, Lord. And Lord, if there are those that, that are suffering or struggling with issues in their life, that you would give them the strength to seek help, Lord. In Jesus' name.